Imagine with me for a second. You have a very successful installment in a franchise that is adored and praised by many. So, you expand upon it with more content. How do you do it? A. Add extra locations for the main characters to discover that feel just as good as, if not better, than what was in the original release. B. Fix tons of issues that many had with the original, allowing them to have even more fun than when the installment first released. C. Add more characters to further flesh out the world and experience. Or D. All of the above, but in the worst way possible. If you answer D, then congratulations! Welcome to the club. With the turn of the decade, Sonic games that have shown high amounts of commercial and critical success have been given the green light from Sega to be given extra content or updates. This instance of expanding upon games, whether free or otherwise, is frequently dubbed downloadable content, or DLC for short. This has become a pretty common practice with a lot of big name games, like Splatoon with the Octo expansion and Side Order, Celeste Farewell Chapter, or Spider-Man with its side campaigns. So today, I'm taking a look at recent instances of DLC in the Sonic series. Now, I'm not going over every single single piece of downloadable content as that would require me to play Sonic Unleashed again. And I'd also have to talk about the small time frame where Sega wanted us to cough up $2 to play a Super Sonic and Sonic Forces before folding and making him a free download. Y'all younger fans are so spoiled with your crazy looking Super Sonic fights. I'll be taking a look at the more in-depth expansions that do more than just add extra shoes or a new character. I'm talking about updates that completely overhaul how many see the game. By the end, I think you'll understand why many of these aren't considered the greatest. They may not have new characters that don't nearly live up to their insane amount of potential, but one of them does make Green Hill Zone orange. Sonic Mania was, and still is, considered one of the best Sonic games ever made. However, one of the many complaints many had when the game first launched back in 2017 was the lack of a physical version of the game. Without that option to physically own the game, many felt that there was a chance that the game could have been lost if any deals were to go under or any bridges were burned. On top of that, many collectors wanted to have a copy of Sonic Mania to display alongside their other games. So, what did Sega do in response? Nothing. Sonic Mania was released exclusively for digital platforms and not the Wii U. We'd have to wait five years for that one. However, a Steam database listing hinted that Sega was planning to expand Sonic Mania with something codenamed Project Plus. Eventually, it would be revealed at Sega's South by Southwest panel in 2018 that Sonic Mania Plus would be the game's official physical retail debut later that year. On top of that, the game will be receiving a complete overhaul, fixing many problems with the game as well as adding a new mode called Encore Mode, with long forgotten characters Mighty the Armadillo and Ray the Flying Squirrel. This was an absolute nuts reveal. The idea that Sega was actually confident enough to allow the Sonic Mania team to bring attention to these long forgotten characters and give them a presence at retail stores was something unheard of at the time. This now happens every other year. I can't wait for Sonic Superstars 2 to bring back Heavy and Bomb in 2026. So, uh, they brought back Anton Veruca instead. Sonic Mania Plus was set for a July 2018 release, so we only had a few months to wait and sit it through. I lied, the entire update with a few caveats was accidentally released on PS4s in Europe a week after the announcement. Yeah, I guess for some reason an internet Sega pressed something wrong and accidentally released the patch that included every bit of Sonic Mania Plus content that was set to be both free and paid, with the exception of Mighty and Rei's playable characters, on European PS4s nearly four months early. How does this even happen? And when the update came out, there was no hot fix or anything. This was the final version of Sonic Mania Plus, which pretty much confirms that the entire update was likely ready before it was even announced, which is honestly kind of funny. Well, let's take a look at this new version of the game and see if it's worth a one year long wait. This is the most 50-50 expansion I've ever played. Sonic Mania Plus's new content can be really split into three separate parts. So let's go over each and see how Sega and Evening Star threw us an apology for not allowing us to buy the game at Target a year prior. The first part of the many additions to the Mania Fever Dream focuses on the physical goodies that you'd get for actually purchasing the game at a Target. I already discussed these goodies when I went over the many ways you could play Sonic Mania, so I'll give you an abridged version of my ramblings. For starters, you have this really cool holographic cover that is begging to become warped over time, then there's this reversible cover that replicates the Sega Genesis covers, and the art book that shows never before seen concept art and blurbs from the developers of the game. I bet no other book has any of that. What does Huck Finn have that Mania's art book doesn't? I can't say that. The lineup of goods that comes with Sonic Mania physically is far more than Evening Star ever had to do, but they did it anyway, and that shouldn't go underappreciated unlike what the extra content itself has to offer. The second part of additions are the various bug fixes, enhancements, and overall improvements to the original Mania Mode experience. These are probably the best things to come out of this whole package game-wise, and they didn't even cost an extra dime on top of the original game. Firstly, each stage has an ending transition that, most of the time, seamlessly progresses you to the next stage. 
The main menu has been almost entirely redone, becoming more of a stack of options on a grid rather than a simple selection screen with symbols on top of the options as you select them. And the last big addition to the main mode is the completely revamped Metal Sonic boss, replacing the original lackluster race against a stack of spikes with Metal Sonic transforming into a monster akin to his appearance in Knuckles Chaotix. These are legitimately really cool additions to an already incredible experience, and I would be perfectly fine if Mania Plus was just this free update. Of course, Mighty and Ray were also playable in the original game, but they were mainly tied to the new DLC campaign, Encore Mode. Okay, how do we make this content worth $5? Uh, this is the one that makes it orange. The final section of content added is the paid Encore DLC. It's just kind of whatever. Okay, well, to give some credit, the new playable characters, Mighty and Ray, are fantastic additions to the main cast. Their animations are spot on and have a few references to their debut game. They each have their own abilities to make the game almost completely different from Sonic, Tails, or Knuckles. Mighty has a powerful stomp that can break through certain floors, and he can use his shell to repel spikes while curled into a ball. This makes him somewhat of an easy mode for newer players, allowing some time to recover from spiked terrain. On the complete opposite spectrum, Ray feels like a character built for players who have memorized a game from front to back. He has the ability to glide across levels and gain momentum from falling and rebounding back into the air. Any normal player can get some decent range with Ray, but people who have mastered him can pull off some wild maneuvers. Mighty and Ray are probably the two best characters in the game for their accessibility and balanced potential. Encore mode sucks! Encore mode is the other main selling point to Sonic Mania Plus. Taking place after Sonic... Uh... Okay. Lore time. So, the main mode in Sonic Mania is considered a prequel to Sonic Forces. At the end of the mode, Sonic is sucked into a portal with the Phantom Ruby. They're both sent to the future at different times, and after the Phantom Ruby is destroyed, Sonic is teleported back to his time. Somehow. In the animation made to promote Sonic Mania Plus, Sonic Mania Adventures, Sonic is shown to return from the game via said teleportation, with no Phantom Ruby in sight, because, you know, they destroyed it. However, in Sonic Mania Plus, Sonic floats out of the same portal from the main Mania mode with the Phantom Ruby. So, that's really confusing. Is Encore Mode not part of the main timeline and just an extra thing while Mania Adventures, the short series that's supposed to promote Encore Mode, is considered canon to the main series? I don't know. Either way, the better product is likely considered canon, so I'm not gonna complain. Encore Mode starts you off by making you free Mighty and Ray and Angel Island Zone from Sonic 3. Oh man, Angel Island Zone? I can't wait to see all the other new zones that they bring back from previous games that they didn't get a chance to revive from the original game. No way, Orange Hill from Molly McGee? Encore mode is essentially slightly redesigned levels from Mania mode with new color palettes. You wanted Ice Cap Zone to make a comeback? Well, I'm sorry, maybe Poop Stain Bad Future Metallic Madness will suffice. Now, I'm sure many of you are thinking, surely this can't be all that Encore mode has to offer, right? Well, you'd be correct. Your lives are replaced by individual characters. You can swap between them on the fly, and if they all die, it's a game over. And that's all Encore mode has to offer. This was $5. As a whole, Sonic Mania Plus is perfectly fine for what it sets out to be. Encore mode does suck. On to Sonic Origins. On the one year anniversary of Sonic Origins release, which was released on the 31st anniversary of the Sonic franchise, the game was updated to become Sonic Origins Plus. I'm gonna give my wife a gift on our 31st anniversary just so that I can give her an extension to said gift on our 32nd. Origins Plus sets out to remedy many of the issues that people had with the original Sonic Origins, such as adding Knuckles to Sonic CD, giving the development team time to finish Sonic 3, and making various fixes to the few bugs found in the games. On top of that, Amy was added as a playable character in each game, and the 12 games from the Sega Game Gear were made playable. Also, this game receives a physical copy similar to Sonic Mania Plus with an art book and all, however, this art book comes with art that's already featured in the museum menu. Why would anybody go out of their way to buy this? That's a good question. I don't have a good answer. This is Sonic Origins Plus. This is also Sonic Origins Plus. Now, by a show of hands, can anyone tell me what this is? Yeah, I made a little challenge of mine to try to get every single version of Sonic Origins Plus that's currently available. Uh, why? I don't know. And why am I showing this off to you? So I can write them off of my taxes. Most of these are identical, but the Switch version comes with this... This, uh, to keep the, uh, thing from going all over the place. Uh, and this is the only one that I have that actually has the reversible cover. The rest are like, uh, boop. The regular one. Uh, but, yeah, that, that's... <laughs> It's just a little funny thing. I have uh, multiple copies of Sonic Origins, and uh, would you believe me if I told you that wasn't all of them? Yeah, I recently bought the Japanese PlayStation 4 copy of Sonic Origins Plus. 
why a magician never reveals their secrets. It's actually way more interesting than most people would anticipate, right? Like, for, first off, a lot of the American versions of Sonic Origins Plus have this really weird grid around them, even on like the physical case itself. Like, uh, the Xbox version here, yeah, it's it's got, it's got this weird grid thing. I don't, I don't know how to feel about that, but the Japanese version, no, no, they're just like, screw them. On top of that, you got this really cool uh, back of the box that honestly, to me, looks way more enticing and intriguing than uh, the American version over here. I, I don't know. I just, I just, I just really like it. And on top of that, when you open the dang, open the dang thing, you can see the art book is inside the cover. Whoa! The American version came with this sleeve that was supposed to hold both the game and the art book because the art book was just too big. People were like, oh, well, I mean, they have to do the sleeve, otherwise the art book wouldn't be able to fit. Wrong. Don't get it twisted. The art book is still terrible, but it, at least it's somewhat in the box, so you don't have to have this extra sleeve just lying around. Oh my gosh, I mean, look, at, look at that reversible cover. Sexy. Yeah, these are all of the physical copies of Sonic Origins Plus I own. Uh, will I ever get another one? No. Because the Japanese version was enough after it gave me this free coaster. Well, let's go over the many things Sonic Origins Plus fixes and introduces and see if it's worth the extra $10. Wait, what's that? So, Sonic Origins doesn't cost an extra $10. It's the same MSRP as the original Sonic Origins at $40. Unless you already bought the game before Origins Plus release, where you do have to purchase the extra content for $10, which includes Amy, Knuckles and Sonic CD, the Game Gear games, and the original Digital Deluxe content. That's right! Even if you purchase the Digital Deluxe Edition when the game first released, you still have to pay full price for the extra content that includes the Digital Deluxe content. So, when you go to purchase the expansion, certain storefronts warn you that you own parts of the expansion. Why? Well, the fact that I was scammed out of $15 aside, is Sonic Origins plus any better than the original game? Yes, I'd actually argue that it's better than Sonic Mania Plus. Oh, that's my address on social media. Origins Plus's main attraction is the addition of Amy Rose as a playable character. She's playable in every single game and can be accompanied by Tails in Sonic 2 and Sonic 3. And unfortunately, she is essentially a slightly modified version of Sonic. She has all of the regular moves that every other character has, but now with an ability to bring out her hammer on a second press of the jump button. Does she gain extra airtime from this move like in Sonic Superstars? Did Martin Luther write about this ability in his 95 Theses? <laughs> Uh, ah, the answer is no. The larger hitbox can be really nice in specific circumstances, but more often than not, it can be really underwhelming and not give Amy her own character. But, oh, you say, what about when Amy can charge up a dash while she jumps that allows her to attack enemies with her hammer? Yeah, what about it? These moves are surprisingly underwhelming, especially for a character that released exactly a year after the original game. However, honestly, I do do kind of prefer this move over the drop dash in a few ways. One of the main key factors is your ability to immediately swap directions and not lose any momentum. Which is probably not intentional, let's get that sorted. This alone genuinely makes Amy one of my favorite characters to play as in Sonic Origins. Is she any great on her own? No. Are the 12 bonus Game Gear games included with Sonic Origins any great on their own? No. To address the complaint of there not being enough side games like in Sonic Mega Collection Plus, Sonic Origins Plus includes 12 emulated Sega Game Gear games on top of the remakes of the main Genesis games. And everybody hated them. But is this not what everybody wanted? Are these games any good? Well, I guess. I discussed a good chunk of them a long while ago, but that doesn't really matter. If you like them, you like them. I remember seeing countless people ask why Sonic 1 and 2 8-bit, Sonic Chaos, Sonic Triple Trouble weren't included as side games, along with games like Sonic Spinball, Sonic 3D Blast, or Knuckles Chaotix when Sonic Origins was originally released. Now that Sonic Origins Plus exists, I see people complaining that the 8-bit games are included instead of Knuckles Chaotix, Spinball, or 3D Blast. Let's play a game. Raise your hand if you really wanted those three games to be included in Sonic Origins Plus. Now raise your hand if you're actually going to play them for more than 5 minutes. I get there are people who like these games. There are even people in the world who like Sonic Spinball. No, they're going to be. But I can guarantee a large majority of people asking for these games would not have played them more than once if they were actually included. Case in point, this is everyone who wanted Sonic Chaos to be included in Sonic Origins. 
and here's the people who actually cared when Sonic Chaos was included in Sonic Origins Plus. Now, a genuine argument against these bonus games are the versions included. Sonic 1, 2, and Chaos are represented through their Game Gear versions, while there are versions for the Sega Master System that are unanimously considered to be superior to the Game Gear versions. Compared to the Game Gear versions, the Master System versions let you see more of the screen, and that's it. While this is a very important feature to increase many people's enjoyment of these games, I can see exactly why they weren't included. For one, this was marketed as 12 Game Gear games, not 12 Game Gear games plus three of those games have Master System versions. Having those versions also included with the Game Gear versions might have been confusing to those not in the know. The second reason is because, like, only three of these games have properly Sega published Master System versions. Sonic 1, 2, and Chaos have their Master System versions with their wider camera and wider camera, but then every other game would be stuck with the smaller aspect ratio of the Game Gear. Having three games be clearly superior to others would likely devalue the collection a bit. Now, would I like to have the option for these three games to come with their Master System versions as a bonus? Well, I mean, yeah, absolutely, but I can see why they weren't added. They also probably weren't added because you wouldn't have played them. Well, versions aside, how do the Game Gear games play? I mean, they're the exact same games. Oh man, the Sega sound is bit crunched. That's how it was originally. Oh, the games have tons of slowdown! That's how it was originally. Yeah, you can kind of tell from the reception of these games in Origins Plus that not many people have actually played them before this. The games run pretty much identically to Origins Plus, sparring a bit of input lag in a few games. The games have always had issues with slowdown, so that isn't really that big of an issue. Overall, if you want to play the Game Gear games for some reason, this is the way to do it. On top of these new things, Sonic Origins Plus also includes various fixes to the original game. Most of the issues found in the porting process from the original Whitehead remakes to Sonic Origins were fixed, and Sonic 3 was finally finished. It took a short amount of time for me to build a shed, why did this take a year to finish? Now, granted, the shed was made out of pretty cheap materials. Think fast! For a while, that was all that was fixed. Until Sega jump scared everyone with a patch that did everything we wanted. They removed the blurry filter! That was the number one problem so many people had with the game! Especially considering the fact that this was fixed by fans on the PC version 24 hours after release. Again, why did this take over a year? A lot of smaller audio related issues were fixed with the Game Gear games. Museum music was apparently added, which seemingly doesn't work for some people. They'd still get pure silence weirdly. I don't know, it worked for me. And Amy can actually complete loops with her hammer attack. Why couldn't she do that before? Overall, it's nice to see the game fix the issues that it had, but I don't understand why it wasn't in this state at launch. Sega had all this potential to fix a few issues found in the original Whitehead remix of these games, but instead they kept them intact for all the fans who hadn't previously played the remakes could see, and they saw them all right. And it took me just now to remember that they also put Knuckles in Sonic CD, and that was a big selling point for Sonic Origins Plus because he wasn't there before. Uh, cool. Should have been there with base Origins. Sonic Origins Plus altogether is, in my opinion, a slightly better deal than Sonic Mania Plus. You get Amy playable in all four games, even though her moveset can be a tad underwhelming. You get 12 Game Gear games of ranging quality. Sonic Labyrinth is actually fun. Try it, you cowards. Knuckles and Sonic CD, which should have been there at launch, all for $10. If that's $1 for every Game Gear game, you're essentially getting two extra Game Gear games free and Amy with Knuckles and Sonic CD for free. And if you didn't already own Sonic Origins Plus, you get all of this for the same MSRP that we bought the base game for. I'm skipping Rent this month. With all of these additions, I can easily call Sonic Origins Plus the best way to officially play the classic Sonic titles. I can't believe I have to say this, but no. The decompilations in the Sonic Forever Team duology are not official and they require you to own the original files anyway to prevent piracy. Which are included in Sonic Origins Plus, so what's the point? Does Sonic Origins Plus make the collection worth $40? Yesn't. No, by the way, sorry in advance. I forgot to take my bad take-itis pills. They prevent me from making really bad impulsive decisions when I see something that I believe to be of very low quality. During Sonic Frontiers' first year on the market, the game received three major updates, changing the way millions played the game. The first two don't really have that much to discuss, so I'll rapid fire through them first. Update 1 introduced a music player that you can expand by collecting musical memory tokens scattered across the islands, a pretty janky and underutilized photo mode that can still somewhat get tons of really cool uses, someone should make a talent show showcasing that, and a ton of challenge modes that can grant you access to new features and even a new one-hit kill difficulty extreme mode. Update 1 was a really solid expansion to the original game and added tons of incentive to master every piece of the game to unlock the new features. Update 2 added tons of visual flair to celebrate Sonic's 32nd anniversary, tons of really well designed platforming challenges that increase your sprint gauge, good grief Sonic team, and a completely new way to experience the island's challenges, 
the action chain challenges. Getting the highest ranking in every single action challenge by cobbling together as many attacks, tricks, and collecting these yellow orbs as possible gives you access to the long-awaited spin dash. With the spin dash, you can absolutely demolish parts of the island that would previously take you minutes to get through. You can obtain insane airtime with the spin dash, allowing you to breeze over an entire island in mere seconds. With that new ability came New Game Plus, which allowed you to replay the entire game with all of your leveled up stats in the spin dash. Although the enemies weren't made any harder, which would have been greatly appreciated, but whatever. Update 2 was an absolute game changer in almost every area of the game. With Update 1 adding some nice quality of life improvements and Update 2 completely overhauling how the game functioned, the third and final update, The Final Horizon, was set to fix the underwhelming ending of the original game, add new playable characters, and rework the final island story. So, how did they do? Sonic Frontiers Update 3 is the worst downfall of a product I've seen in eons. Wait, no, it's the second worst. Like, I don't understand, by all accounts, this should be one of the best Sonic experiences of all time. New playable characters, expansions on lore, Ian Flynn returning to write again, and a new final boss, incredible music, but I don't know. I really don't like this. I, I kind of hate this. Nothing about this update really fixed anything with the base game. It more so adds things on top of the really fun, beautiful mess that was the original game. However, instead of this being a really fun, beautiful mess like the original game, Update 3, The Final Horizon, is a frustrating, confusing, occasionally unfair, and for the most part, abhorrently unfun experience. That doesn't make it the worst Sonic thing ever made, no, there's definitely some good here, but it's shocking to me how much I didn't enjoy myself most of the time, and I know I'm not alone in that. Despite what my social security number being readily available online might tell you otherwise. The Final Horizon had thousands of fans pulverize after completion. Some people thought it made Sonic Frontiers one of the greatest Sonic experiences ever made, while some believed it soured the game's reputation in their minds, making the original game seem worse than it actually is. Obviously, I've made it clear where I stand about it, but please, allow me to go into more detail before the little kids on the forums figure out how to get to my location. So, the Final Horizon starts you out by entering this giant ring in the original version of the final island, Oranos. This update is pretty much an alternate take on the ending of the original game that is considered by the game as separate from the original finale. Essentially, Mario Kishimoto really likes Neon Genesis Evangelion. The story of the Final Horizon follows similar beats to the original, grabbing the Chaos Emeralds to destroy the end. However, the way that this is done is entirely different in dialogue and also gameplay. And that they're both worse. I don't know what happened, but somehow the Final Horizon's dialogue is infinitely worse than the original game. I'm actually a big defender of the original game's character interactions. I'm a huge fan of the influence work on the game, a few decisions notwithstanding. But in Update 3, it feels like Ian's parodying his own work from time to time. References to previous games are astronomically more annoying than they were in the original game. I remember groaning and cringing when I heard Knuckles unnecessarily reference the Babylon Rogues and Rouge the Bat out of nowhere. I laughed when I saw the side cutscene that is no joke, a glorified way of saying, look, we fixed Amy Rose's character. I'm not just a damsel in distress anymore. Just you watch. Eventually, you'll be the one relying on me for help. Amy has only been a damsel in distress in a video game one time. Now the writers are acting like she's always been this way. She's always relying on Sonic for help. She's never stood up for herself. Guys, guys. GUYS! Hey guys, did you know that Tails has self-esteem issues? We definitely didn't go through this story arc in the original game. What's next? They start saying lyrics to iconic songs? Oh, but I suppose that doesn't concern someone like you, who can't do anything but roll around at the speed of sound. Lego Dimensions did this eight years ago, and it did it infinitely better than you. Sorry, Master King. Looks like I'm going all out after all. That was definitely a dialogue choice. Oh no, the dialogue choices and the added parts of the story kind of fall flat in my opinion. It isn't terrible, but compared to Ian's other phenomenal works on the series, it fumbles. But who knows, maybe the gameplay will make up for the lackluster story. Finally, after nearly 17 years, we have multiple unique playable characters in a mainline Sonic game. Each character was set to have their own movesets, their own skill trees, puzzles, and would completely change how players looked at Sonic Frontiers. It's just like this date I went on once. It certainly changed me forever. 
I swore off relationships for life after it. Sonic Frontiers The Final Horizon is like Celeste Farewell if Celeste Farewell was made with duct tape, a few paper clips, and the time that it takes to make a child. On top of including extra challenges for Sonic, which we'll get into in a moment, it reintroduces Tails, Knuckles, and Amy to the roster of playable characters. Oh, let's look at Tails first! I can't wait to see all the cool combos you can perform with this Tails like in Sonic Adventure and Sonic 06. Wrenches. He throws wrenches as his main attack. Well, at least he can still, his fly has a wind-up, uh, and it doesn't even gain that much height. Okay, well, uh, that's fine. I wonder what combos you can perform. What, what, what does he have? Throwing more wrenches and using them as a trampoline. Okay, uh, can he chain it in with a combo attack? Oh, wow, no, he, he does not use the homing attack. I mean, Tails does have his plane from Sonic Adventure 2, and he can use it to <clears throat> skip his sections entirely and beat the game faster than you should normally, huh? Wow. Uh, well, maybe Knuckles has tons of potential for combat. He's a very known skilled fighter. Well, let's see what moves he has. O okay, he actually has the homing attack this time. Wow, okay. Uh, well, as well as a general jab attack. That's cool. Oh, he has this cool stomp and a glide that controls like a tank. That's nice. What else does he have? N no. That's it? Of all the characters to lack in abilities, Knuckles should not even be a contender in that category. You can't mess up Amy. You cannot. Amy is known for wielding such a powerful hammer, she can run fast like Sonic too, so I'm sure you could have some incredible speed-related abilities in there. Oh, maybe you can include a few abilities related to her fortune cards. She already uses them quite a sizable amount in the story now that I think about it. Why not use them in her moveset? Alright, looks like they do have a few moves related to the cards. Cool. Let's see what else she can do. She can spin the cards. Okay, well, well, what about movement abilities? How fast can she go? She uses the hammer as a witch's broom and surrounds herself with a fortune card wheel. Does she use her hammer in combat at all? Okay, it appears in her parry animation. Who designed these characters? One of the main selling points of Sonic Frontiers was that Sonic was set to have a full set of combat abilities that would make every fight you had with an enemy unique. Granted, once you leveled up, most of the fights were the same, but you still had a decent variety of moves. A crap ton of beams emanating from Sonic's shoes. Tons of different types of kicks. A lightning fast spin dash that turns into a dangerous blade. Sonic cloning himself to decimate his foes, and like, two other moves after that. So, if Sega could do things like that for Sonic alone, imagine all the possible moves that they could give his friends. Well, imagine if you want, because apparently Sega can't! These characters feel so empty compared to Sonic. They have a max of like three moves that you can use in combat, making them significantly weaker, less viable, and less fun than Sonic. Their movesets aren't the greatest either, with Knuckles controlling like a tank while gliding, Amy actually being pretty decent aside from the side loop input delay. Good job, Sega. And Tails not being able to properly fly, and he has a move that allows him to skip all of his platforming challenges. And speaking of those platforming challenges... <laughs> I'm a Molly McGee discusser now. These required platforming sections are absolutely dreadful. Now, the optional ones that give you the extra Coco or extra XP are actually pretty decent and use your movesets in really fun ways. The required ones make me want to see a counselor. Many of them use moves on the skill tree that you are never told are required to use when previous platforming sections in the original game never required you to level up significantly on the skill tree before. On top of that, you're never told how these moves work, only what button to press when you know how it works, which most people skip anyway because it's annoying and gets in the way. Like this moment with Knuckles, for example. You have to enter this giant floating cube to dodge a ton of missiles and use his side knuckle move on specific highlighted areas. You are never told you need to use the side knuckle by this point, pretty early on in the game. Another thing you aren't told is that the side knuckle runs out of energy and can only be regained through a large sum of rings, which isn't the easiest thing to do while being attacked by bullets. So, you need to make sure that your side knuckle is fully charged and attempt to not get hit by the incredibly fast bullets. If you are hit by a single one of these bullets, you are sent plummeting to your death with no way to recover, being sent back to the beginning of the platforming section that preceded the giant cube. Who tested this? Now, difficult sections in games aren't inherently a bad thing. Celeste, one of my favorite games of all time, handled this perfectly. 
Each section is split up by invisible checkpoints. If you die on a tough section, you're sent back to the beginning of said tough section within milliseconds of dying, allowing you to quickly return to that part where you died and take what you learned to conquer it. In the Final Horizon, on the other hand, if you get hit in a section like this, you're sent falling into a death plane with no control of your character, so you have to wait for your character to die after a solid few seconds. Then, when they finally die, you have to sit on this try again screen for a few seconds to let the game load back to the previous checkpoint, which is way before the tough section. Why? If your game isn't designed around having challenges like this without feeling cumbersome, don't do challenges like this! And this is scattered all across the Final Horizon. You die, a few seconds pass, try again, a few seconds pass again, and you're back to a long way before the part where you died. These challenges are bafflingly poorly designed, and I really hope they're able to significantly improve them in a future game. Sonic has these weirdly designed challenges too, with the five towers that he has to climb to gain access to the trials to gain a new power to fight the final boss. Speaking of those trials... Why did you give me all that time? This isn't a history test in Mrs. Benson's class. These tower trials are so bizarre in that it feels like elements in them are mixed up. Like, this challenge requires you to destroy enemies that are moving at like two times speed, which is already tough because their weak point only shows up originally for like five seconds. So divide that by two in a minute and a half. Are you kidding me? Long gone are the days where Sonic Frontiers would give you too much time for a challenge. Now, we're given barely enough time to make a dang sandwich. And guess what? I lied. I did make that sandwich in the time that it takes for me to fight the earliest boss in the game in this trial. How long, you ask? Ten minutes. This is the first boss you fight, which can take the average player 30 seconds. This is the last trial before the Master King. Do you not see the problem? Well, if it was that easy, I can't wait to see how easy the Master King trial is. Oh, look at that, it's my sarcasm alarm. It goes off when I'm being sarcastic. So, the Master King's trial, the final trial before the final boss, has you fight the Titan boss fights on a row on default stats with a limited parry and a set amount of rings. Well, that doesn't sound too bad. The parry system was already really forgiving, so it'll be nice to have an extra bit of challenge. Ah. Right. So, while these bosses would benefit from a more limited parry system than the original, which would let you hold for an opening for at most 30 seconds, limiting it to something as drastic as 3 frames is not the way to go. Since these bosses weren't designed with that limit in mind, movements from Giganto and especially Wyvern don't exactly match the time frame that you can activate the parry with. Meaning, you have to memorize where each attack's hitbox begins, which is practically impossible unless you spend far too much trying to figure them out. On top of that, you're on a strict time limit. The maximum capacity of rings is set to your default, 400, and it stays that way until the boss rush is finished. So every waking second you're supersonic, you're losing precious time. That combined with the numerous unskippable cutscenes and prerequisite challenges with Wyvern make this trial among some of the worst Sonic experiences I have ever experienced. Hey, uh, it's 7 a.m. on March 16th, and this video is supposed to drop today. Uh, but I completely forgot uh, to mention that you can actually make the parry a bit more uh, forgiving on easier difficulties. Uh, I play this on hard mode because normally Sonic games on hard mode are very easy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can you can lower it. Uh, and also, before you say anything, I know the game was patched. I have not played the patch. And I do not want to play the patch. I think it's just Knuckles' gliding and the parry being a bit more forgiving. That's it. I don't care. Anyway, back to the thing. Well, now that the trials have been completed, we reach the final part of the update. The new and improved final boss. The original final boss was Supreme, essentially a reskin version of the first Titan boss, Giganto, followed up by a more in-depth version of the minigame that you played minutes prior against a giant floating rock called The End. But now it's time to finally get a true final boss. Let's see what they changed. This footage is from the Final Horizon. They didn't even give him his wings back. Okay, well, in reality, they kept the first phase the same because they were saving all of their budget on the second phase. After you beat Supreme, the end brings down some giant umbilical cord, attaches it to Supreme, and takes control of it as a vessel. At first, this seems too powerful for even Supersonic. However, using the power he gained from completing the trials, he transforms into... a... Supersonic with blue eyes. Well, according to the voices in my head, people with blue eyes are actually more intelligent than those with red. Look it up, it's true. So, therefore, I shall be dubbing the slight design change, Smarter Supersonic. 
Anyway, Smarter Supersonic is by and large the original Supersonic. The only real difference is that he can deal more damage and has this really cool parry animation. Ooh. In this fight, Smarter Supersonic has to use the more strict parry from the Master King trial. Now, now, that sounds horrifying, but surprise, surprise, when you design a boss around that parry timing, it actually makes sense and works really well. Who would have thought? After you pull off some genuinely really cool looking moves, Smarter Supersonic flies into Supreme's gun that you take away from him earlier on in the fight to use up every bit of energy he gains from the trials, getting a form that looks way cooler than Smarter Supersonic and destroys the end once and for all. Afterwards, we get a nice parallel to the original finale of the game, with Eggman looking on at the shooting stars, now with his daughter, who doesn't die in this version of the ending. He says she can go home with him, bringing Sonic Frontiers, The Final Horizon, to a close. The finale of this update is probably one of the highlights of the game, strange designs involving how to use specific moves notwithstanding. However, that doesn't really make the journey leading up to it all that satisfying. I didn't like nearly any aspect of The Final Horizon. Although, there was one thing that did pique my interest that many people likely didn't even experience on their first playthrough. The new cyberspace stages. These new cyberspace stages are genuinely really nice additions to the game. The remix versions of pre-existing cyberspace stages now with new pathways that require you to use moves in new and interesting ways to get to the goal as fast as possible. They come with new remixes that give new energies to the tracks, new collectibles with their own branching pathways, and... Let's not talk about the animals, okay? I want to be positive for a change. The spin dash is required for most of these stages, so there are tons of pathways that you can gain access to from flying off a terrain or building enough speed to jump across a large gap. With the addition of the spin dash and the new branching pathways, the new cyberspace stages are genuinely some of the most fun I've had in a Sonic game in years. It's just a shame that it's buried on top of this giant load of trash that's in front of my house. Why did they dump it all here? Sonic Frontiers The Final Horizon could have and should have been a slam dunk. However, there are so many parts of it that feel undercooked, untested, or straight up bad. There are diamonds in the rough, but there are very few and far between. To me, it feels like Sonic Team tried to put too much into this update, and thus were not able to make everything as polished as they should be. The original game was a messy but fun experience. However, The Final Horizon is just messy. And those are the main updates and DLC for the Sonic series, aside from the very small and insignificant ones. Not many of them were that great, heck, I'd say they were at best decent. But seeing newer Sonic games get support beyond their initial release is great to see, especially after games like Team Sonic Racing lacked post-release support. Hopefully this trend continues with upcoming Sonic games and only improves in terms of quality. In a perfect world, Sega learns from their mistakes and allows their developers to further develop visions, figure out their limits, and make games even better post-release as a result. These existing updates and DLCs aren't the greatest, but if given the time and resources, future expansions could absolutely be brilliant. We just need to express what's good and what's bad about them in our eyes. You know what you did! Come out and apologize for disrespecting Pink Fiction! Huh. Well, it looks like the kids did find my location.